Welcome to History Talks. I'm your host, Will. This is Sebastian. In this episode, we continue our series on the communist revolutions of the 20th century, and today we will be discussing communism in Eastern Asian countries. So, Sebastian, in some previous episodes in this series, we had discussed communism in China, but today we'll be discussing some of the other countries in Eastern Asia where communism rose to prominence. So, Sebastian, tell me, how did that happen? Let's start with North Korea. The Korean Peninsula was occupied by Japan uh, in, uh, prior to World War II. During World War II, uh, the Soviet Union declared war on Japan uh, near the end of the war, uh, and they occupied the area, the regions of Manchuria, and began occupying Korea. Hmm. However, after the bombs dropped, the Japan officially surrendered to the United States, basically giving the U.S. Uh, free reign over all of the Japanese territories that were not already occupied. Mm. So now came the decision for how to divide up the territories, and, we, and we'll start with Korea. Korea, the Soviet occupied north was uh, given to the Soviets to create a puppet state, and the south was um, given to the United States to create their own uh, State there. Oh, really? And what year is this when it was when the North was given to the Soviets? Uh, this was uh, 45. 1945. So we're talking the immediately after World War II. Was this even part of the uh, the Warsaw Pact that we had discussed in a prior episode? It was. We'll get to that. Okay. North Korea. So, um, but we're just going to say there was some sort of agreement that gave the North to the Soviets. And the South to America. Yeah, I believe at the Yalta Conference. Yalta Conference, okay. Anyways, um... So, officially, officially there were supposed to be uh, free elections in uh, both countries. However, the Soviets propped up the leader of the Workers' Party of Korea, Kim Il-sung. Hmm and uh, placed him as the supreme, as the president, later the supreme leader, mm. of the Democratic People's Republic of North, of Korea. Mm, okay. You know, always a good sign when you need to specify in your name how democratic and for the people you, you are. Mm -hmm. And this was, this was all of Korea, or he was just North Korea? Just North. Just North Korea, okay. And, um... Soon after he was put into power, he, uh, Kim, Kim Il-sung, uh, began reorganizing North Korea into his centrally planned communist image. So, you know, he began, uh, pub, uh, nationalizing major industries and, and stuff like that. However, um, one key divergence was Juche, the philosophy that uh, Kim proposed. Okay, and just to stop you for a second, this is all happening in 1945 or soon after 1945, and he's within the, within the years following 1945. Within the, so we're all in the the mid to late 1940s, and he's Kim Il Young. Kim Il Sung. Kim Il Sung is backed by the Soviet Union. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. And he rules the DPRK. Okay. Is there any resistance to him taking power? Um, no. And if there... Not known. If there were any, it would probably be crushed by Soviet tanks, but we don't know of Okay, any. that's what I was Maybe. wondering. There's, there's, no, there's no real resistance. Maybe there's people who don't like it, but there's nobody who has the ability to, to um, oppose him taking power. Yeah. And by this point, most of the people who would have preferred capitalism would have probably, probably moved to the South. Okay. Okay, so they've already had their own sort there. Yeah. Okay. So now, um, he begins uh, publicizing uh, property, or not publicizing, nationalizing. Mm -hmm. And Juche is really important when you need to understand North Korea. It, when you first hear it, it sounds... It, so the way Kim described it is... This idea of self-reliance of the great Korea, of the great socialist Korea um, rising up and becoming a self-reliant, independent nation 
and a beacon of communism for all the world to see. Wow. Hmm. You can almost think of it as... You can almost think of it as, um... It's, in many ways, it's, uh, Jute is very, uh, cult-like in... Because at the center of Jute is the supreme leader, okay. Kim Il-sung, mm -hmm. the glorious leader who will lead the very independent Korean people to glory and prominence. Okay. Or at least that's how he presents it, right? Yeah. The very independent people of Korea who are essentially um, under his thumb, and he is operating a puppet state of the Soviet Union. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yep. Makes perfect sense. Well, hey, when it comes to when commies run things, that's how they like to talk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, the, we're the democratic republic of authoritarian rule, and if you don't like us, then we'll kill you. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. They even held mock elections where um, Kim got 97% of the votes. Hmm. Wow. Very popular guy around there. Yep. That You know what's interesting when they do that is that they actually even have 3% against him. Like, do you think do you I, think they just throw that in there? They're like, you know, we were we were gonna give him hundred percent, but let's just give him three percent. You know, make it more believable. To, yeah, yeah, exactly. Make it look like there's a very small resistance anyway. But you know, every but everybody who is reasonable loves Kim Il Song. Of course. <laughs> who wouldn't Supreme Leader. Yeah, there you go. I, mean, I can't wouldn't. I can't do a Korean accent, but yeah, I can't either. You do some other good accents though, but yeah. Anyways so, in 1950, Kim, as part of his philosophy of, of North Korea is best Korea and best Korea is best country, hmm. he decides to invade South Korea. Okay. He thinks he's going to take on South Korea on his own. Uh, the other communist countries are going to be proud of him. It's going to show the superiority of the North Koreans. And there will be a united Korean peninsula under his rule. Okay. Uh, furthering his idea of a united Korean people all striving for this Juche ideal. Okay. So, in 1950, he invades. He crosses the border with his troops, mm. and the South Korean... South Korea was going through a bit of turmoil, should we say. Wait, do we know at this time, when he does this, do we know if he's backed by the Soviets? Do the Soviets say, oh yeah, expand? Or are they like, eh... The Soviets do not seem to, the Soviets do not seem to be in full support of this operation. Oh, so maybe they're more neutral on it. Yeah. Okay. They they don't directly tell him don't do this, but but you know who knows if this could be what triggers the nuclear war. Yeah, because if they they do know if if uh, as a result of the Yalta conference, if the United States has some kind of ties to South Korea. And he's going yeah. in and evading that. They know that that is an indirect attack on the U.S. That's that's going to that's going to uh, inflate conflict between them. Yeah. So the Soviets don't get involved. Okay. How, and however, South Korea is going through its own problems. You see, South Korea also was ruled by a dictator, a U.S. backed di dictator oh. who was supposed to implement capitalism by being friendly to U.S. multinationals. <laughs> of course. How, how democratic. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, the North was going through problem, was going through, you know, economic problems, um, that were not completely destroying the, com the country thanks to Soviet investment. Hmm. However, South Korea, a lot of people did not like the government in charge of South Korea. Interesting. So they push the South really far because because of the unpopularity of the Southern dictator and the um, successful propaganda of the of Kim. He's able to push them back down to just a small corner of the peninsula, hmm. and it looks like oh the North is going to overrun the South, and this is when the U.S. is like oh my. This is when the U.S. realizes that there is an actual threat to South Korea. Hmm. So this is when the, tr the troops finally arrive in South Korea, and the combined forces of the United States of America and South Korea just overwhelm the North Koreans. They push them back to the border, and then they push them back farther. They take Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea, and it looks like, okay, uh, South Korea will just completely take over North Korea. Hmm. 
But then, China gets involved. Because China does not want to be... Does not want to share a border with a U.S. puppet. Mm, yeah. Or okay. basically, one. Okay. So... So the Soviets are not involved in backing North Korea, but China is involved in backing them. Yeah. Okay. And the Soviets eventually decide to be indirectly involved by, like, sending uh, guns, but not sending their own troops. Oh, okay. Well, they say, hey, we're not the only ones backing it now, so we got China, too. We can, we can all team up, right? Yeah. But China, Soviets, North Korea, the Soviets we can all don't, team up. The Soviets don't send their own men into the conflict, but they do send guns. Mm. China, however, does send its men into the conflict, mm. and they manage to push push the U.S. backed forces down to near where the border was before the war, and okay. then it be just becomes a stalemate. Mm. And then, so by 1953, three years after the war started, mm. they sign a, not a peace treaty technically, but it's technically an armistice. Okay. What this armistice does is it creates the Korean demilitarized zone, mm -hmm. a small stretch of land uh, along the border where basically no troops are allowed, and um, but so and they when can, you say small strip. What is it like a mile wide or something like? I that? I think it's like three miles. Three wide. miles wide. No, so no soldiers, no planes fly over it. Nothing, right? No tanks, I'm assuming. Yeah, they can go all the way up to the line, but they right. can't cross the but line. But basically, yeah, they've got this three-mile barrier. And uh, just, well, you'll tell me. Does anyone ever try to cross the line, or do both sides respect it? Um, no troops cross the line. Okay, but that's fine. It's a demilitarized zone, so yep. civilians are, are allowed to cross it, right? Um, theoretically, though, like, neither country wants its citizens to leave. Okay, I see. So they each prevent, try to prevent their own citizens from going into this demilitarized zone. Yeah. So it's just some kind of no man's land. Is anybody there? Nobody's there. In fact, uh, right now it's actually become a, a bit of a safe haven for nature just because nobody wants to go oh, there. Oh, interesting. So this, okay, so this demilitarized zone was, um, was created in 1953, and to this day, in 2020, it still exists. Yeah. That's pretty amazing. Yep. And from then, and then from then on, uh, this, neither Soviet Soviets nor China would approve another Korean War, hmm. and the North realized that it probably had better things to do than to go up against uh, South Korea, who now who now had actual U.S. troops who were stationed who were stationed there in the long term I in, gotcha. in preparation. So it just wasn't the Korea uniting the Koreas were just not worth it for anybody. Yeah, no nobody involved. They said. You know what? We'll just stay where we are. Keep this demilitarized zone, and uh, it'll be some some nature park. Maybe maybe they have what? Do people go like hiking there and things like that? You know, because they because they've got. I mean, that it's nature. always a bit suspicious if you try to go to try to go there. So. Oh, is it okay? If you want to enjoy nature or something like that, they might be. Like, yeah, what, what there's are you like up to? like sometimes photographers are yeah, able to go there, but like. Okay, so if I ever wanted to go hiking in some completely, uh, you know untouched place, that would not be a good place to go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Though there are, like, checkpoints and places oh. where, and, oh. and, and yeah. like, at the edges of the, at the edges of, like, the peninsula, there are places where, like, the border is a bit closer, but... Mm. Interesting. But, um, anyways... Okay, so, so back to North Korea. So I know, uh, it's Kim Il... Kim Il Sung. Kim Il Sun. Isn't it, isn't his son now running North Korea? His grandson. His, oh, his grandson. Oh, oh. So we're a couple of generations later, but it's still, is it still to this day a similar sort of setup where you have the supreme leader, yes. ruling in this authoritarian, democratic <laughs> yeah. system. What do they still have the uh, the elections have, and everything where you, where you get ninety seven percent of the vote? They still have the same systems. However, there are a few key differences between sixties and seventies North Korea and today's North okay. Korea. Mm -hmm. Namely that 60s and 70s Korea had like Soviet investment and some of the central planners had a, knew what they were doing and were focused on things other than, you know, nuclear weapons. Okay. And because their focus was more inward and on the economy, mm -hmm. they, they, it wasn't actually that terrible during the 60s in North Korea. It okay. was still not good, but, right. but, but it was, it was acceptable. 
Yeah, especially yeah, compared to a living. Nobody's people are not starving and that sort of thing. Yeah, no mass starvation. Just, okay. but it's just there's not a whole lot of grow. No, no Maoist style Great Reset, which results yeah. in tens of millions of deaths. Okay, that's good. So at least at least people are able to live. Yeah, especially especially when compared to basically in South Korea, because nobody liked the dictator, everyone was protesting. Wow. Okay. Interesting. Um. So anyways, basically, so this is how North Korea rules for a while, though during the 70s, the stagnation starts to show as the economy, you know, their exports become less and less competitive, and then eventually, um, in the 80s, the Soviets have to start cutting back on their support to their puppets, and the first ones to get cut are the North Koreans. Oh, interesting. I wonder why. Um, it's just not as important as the Eastern Bloc to them. Oh, yeah, Eastern Bloc is right next to them there. It's not on the other side of China. And what about Cuba? Were they still subsidizing Cuba at that point? And they they were also getting cut back. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Cuba's an ocean away, but they are also strategically placed right next to the United States. So, okay. So North Korea gets cut off, right? Yeah. Right. Their sugar daddy, the Soviet yeah. daddy, cuts <laughs> them off. They, they're, they're kind of struggling. Okay, so we're we're in what the nineteen seventies, nineteen eighties now. Yep. And okay. what are we at? Kim Il Sun's son now is it is it Junior is running things? It's not the grandson yet, or is um, it still is still the uh, the the granddad. Basic in nineteen ninety four, mm -hmm. um, when Kim Il Sung is eighty two years old, he finally yeah. passes away. Wow. And okay. he, and he leaves it to his son Kim Jong Il. Okay. And Kim Jong Il runs it much the same way, with the same cult of personality, the same, right. uh, you know, general system. Okay, so it's just like having an extension of his dad. Yeah, you get and they actually have this whole thing when he dies, where, mm -hmm. like, they had a year where you were required to be sad and mourning over oh, wow. his death. Huh. Yeah, like, it was just, just illegal to be happy for that year. <laughs> oh, man. Because everyone was supposed to be so sad over his death. It's like, ah, I caught you smiling. <laughs> yeah. After the gulags. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Or oftentimes, uh, they would actually send them to Chinese worker camps. Oh, sh to... man. Yeah. We caught you telling a joke and laughing. We're sending you off to China. Yeah. <laughs> man. Sounds like an interesting place. Yeah. Uh, then, then, Maybe they had underground places where they meet and, and tell jokes or something like that. You know? Yeah. And then later, you know, I believe in the 2010s is when Kim Jong-il dies of, like, heart failure or something. Okay, so he's, he's an extension of his dad. He's in power for a, a couple decades, it sounds like. Two yeah. or two and a half decades. And then Kim Jong-un, the current oh. ruler, he takes power. Okay. And um, he's similar, except he's, even, except he's more focused on stuff like nuclear production and nuclear research. Oh, okay. He's, so, like, building bombs. It, interesting, because he wants to make his impact in the world. He knows that if he has nuclear weapons, that um, yeah. it's kind of hard not to notice that. Yeah. And, you know, recently there's rumors about him having health problems relating to obesity, but... Mm. Yeah. But that's a story for another time. Okay. Anyway, how old is he, do we know? Uh, he was... He was born in, um... I think... I want to say he's, like, 30s, I want to say. Okay, so he... So if he stays in power, he may... If, or if he stays in, in good health... Or decent health, at least, he might have a few more decades in him. Yeah, but... Okay. Anyways, let's move on to Vietnam. Okay. Vietnam is an interesting case. Prior to World War II, it was a colony of France, mm. along with Laos and, I think, Cambodia. Okay. It was part of a colony called French Indochina. French Indochina, wow. Yeah. And, um, prior to the World Wars, uh... It, it was a bit competitive with British uh, Thailand, hmm. but after the but after World War One, the British were more supportive of France keeping it, and after World War Two, uh, hmm. Britain and the United States wa wanted France to try to get s to keep some hold over it. Interesting, Did especially know... especially since uh, during World War Two, Japan had occupied the country. Oh, okay. And they had installed a puppet king called, um, forgive my pronunciation, Bao Dai, I think his name was. Bao Dai. Okay. And, but, 
And yeah, his, okay. his dynasty was ain't was uh his dynasty was pretty ancient. He was from the Nguyen family, okay. but um, he himself was not very well liked. Okay, so basically, the Japanese had power over Vietnam at this point. They chose somebody from an old established family yeah. to basically be their puppet king. Yeah. Okay. However, after World War II, he was forced to abdicate, mm. and there became a, aim a bit of a gray area over who would actually rule Vietnam, mm -hmm. because soon after the guy was forced to abdicate, this guy called Ho Chi Minh mm -hmm. um, became a bit excited, and he he um, he got together with some other uh, influential figures, and they created a government called the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. Another Democratic Republic. Yep. Interesting. And they ruled for all of 20 days before the French came in and said, no, and, and forced them to go underground. Hmm. This sparked the first Indochina War. Okay. Where basically... What, what year are we talking about here? So the first Indochina War starts in 49. 49, okay. This is also post-World War II. Yeah. Okay. And oh, that's interesting. So France retained... Vietnam as a colonial possession, even after World War Two. Yeah. Okay. But Japan there, but had there really had control during during World War Two, but then they went back to France after. Yeah, but okay. then even but then even then, their after World War Two, their control was somewhat diminished. Mm, okay. Um, and nobody exactly had good memories of French plantations, mm. so. Okay. Um. So, anyways, um. So this marks the first Indochina War, which lasts up until 54. Okay. In 54, Ho Chi Minh and the French government sign a treaty where basically France recognizes that it's no longer able to um, keep control over Vietnam. But this is, but this is after the, the Korean War, and when the Cold War has really started to kick off. Hmm. So they're like, okay, well let's try to use this opportunity to, you know, limit communist influence. Okay. So, they ba so basically the treaty says that there are two governments in Vietnam. The North, which, was, which already had a greater population of communists, probably due to its uh, proximity to China, mm -hmm. would be ruled by this People's Republic of Vietnam, as it was now called. Okay. And the South would just be the Republic of Vietnam, hmm. and it would be capitalist and uh, democratic and... Interesting. Or actually, at first it wasn't the Republic of Vietnam. At first hmm. it was ruled by that Bao guy of all people. Well, that's interesting. They also have a North and South similar to Korea. Yeah. Huh. So, here's what happens. Um, and the North is the communist side? Yeah. In both cases. That's interesting. Here's where it gets interesting. So at first the French are like, what if we put this Bao Dai guy in charge of the South? Because mm -hmm. he said that he'll um, help support French, uh, the interests of French businesses. Okay. But but then but nobody likes Bao Dai, so mm -hmm. the When you say nobody, I mean clearly foreign powers like him. The Japanese liked him, the yeah. French liked him, but you're saying the Vietnamese people, they don't like him. Yeah. Okay. However they And may maybe that's why they don't like him, because they're like He's a puppet for Japan or France or whoever else. Yeah, I think that's why they don't like. Oh, him. that's exactly why. Okay, but um, they had all. But France had set it up as a constitutional monarchy, and the prime minister basically very quickly abolished the monarchy. And mm -hmm. and because there weren't enough people in Vietnam who wanted to stop him, uh, it just went through. Okay, and the France was France was okay with this because. Um, you know, be better than in infighting when there's communism up north. Right. And the U.S. especially continued investing in Vietnam. And it, not just that, it's late in the colonial era. We're talking around 1950 at this point? Yeah, You know, I mean, most, aren't, aren't most colonial possessions... Yeah, um, most, most are either break... Most of... I mean, this is around the time Africa is breaking away yeah, and exactly. finishing their breakaway. Yeah, so that's something. This is the very end. So if, if France does have any influence over it, I mean, of course, the United States, we don't have colonies, but we have 
places where we go and bring yeah. democracy to their yeah. country, you know, by, by bombing them and installing uh, whoever we want in power and things yeah. like that, but, um, which is technically not colonialism, but it's it's got some similarities. Okay, but it's at the end of the era where France would have colonial possessions. Yeah. yeah. So Laos, Cambodia, the two Vietnams, they're all released. And, um, they... And initially, South Vietnam's all like, all right, let's do some land reforms because uh, for a long time the nobility has had like a really harm harmful monopoly on land. So mm -hmm. let's make it easier for private citizens to own land. Let's um, you know uh, help break up monopolies and okay. expand to more of a free market. Okay. But Ho Chi Minh is like, you know what? France has just pulled out. What what if we went in there and did a People's Liberation War. Huh. Interesting. And at, but, but, um, but everyone remembers the Korean War and what happened there. Yeah. So Ho Chi Minh starts by sending a letter to the Politburo mm -hmm. at, of the Soviet Union, basically saying, "Hey, would you support a war against the South?" Mm -hmm. And and the Soviet Union agrees. So Viet, so North Vietnam invades mm -hmm. South Vietnam. And do you know what year this is? 1955. 55, okay. All right. And so that so two years so the United States was involved in a conflict in Korea up until 1953. Yeah. And they and then they got their demilitarized zone and said, "Okay, we're we're done with this for now." Then 1955 all of a sudden it's a very similar yeah. situation. <laughs> you have a northern a, a split nation when the northern part wants to invade the southern part to expand communism. Yeah. With the backing of or at least the the part in this case, it sounds like they have the outright backing of the Soviet Union. When, yeah. When Korea did it, they kind of had this mm, maybe some neutrality or slight backing from the Soviet Union, some backing from the Chinese. But in this case, Vietnam sounds like the Soviets are yeah. openly backing them. Yeah. And the U.S. also, in, instead of you know waiting for the North to start you know taking over, they immediately as soon as the war breaks out. Uh, we start sending troops there. Okay. And that also ties back to, we did an earlier episode on Cuba. Yeah. Right, where I talked about his, and isn't it, isn't it kind of interesting? Because I, I think Castro, had, Castro had taken power around this time, is that right? Or is he, it was more like I 1960. Forget it. I feel like, like I forget it, I forget if it was 51 or 59, but okay. it I was, think it, it might have been 59. Yeah, you're right. It wasn't until a few years later. That's right. Because we, we talked about how the United States was ignoring this, um, communist takeover in their own backyard while fighting yeah. in Asia and they were said the world. But that comes in a few years. Yeah. So, um, the main theory as to why the U.S. was much more eager to the Vietnam War was, you know, this had been around the time the domino theory was born. Right. Which was this idea that if one country be, falls to communism, then the next, and then the next, then, then the next. Keep, right, it'll keep expanding. However, I think it's also a bit more than that. That's obviously a factor. However, I also think that both the U.S. and the Soviet Union looked at the Korean War and realized just how easy it would be for the other side to rush down uh, the uh, their side and you know quickly take over if you don't get your troops fast at, there fast enough. I see. So my theory is that you know the U.S. just wanted to prevent another Korea by immediately getting involved. And okay. However, however. Um, it doesn't quite end up being very quick. Because mm. let, let's think about Vietnam. Okay. It's a jungle. Right. Um, most of it is, anyway. It's, it's the best, it's one of the best terrains possible for guerrilla warfare. Mm -hmm. And they're fighting against locals who tend to be better at guerrilla warfare. Right. In fact, Vietnam was one of the few places that the Mongols had trouble invading. Mm. Okay. So, because the locals know the land, and know, they know the swamps, they know the rivers, they know the forests, they yeah. know the jungles. Yeah. So when the U.S. gets involved in '55, it it becomes a struggle from the outset. Mm. This struggle is only advanced by the fact that China is basically like, well, we like to get involved, but. We are kind, of, but we kind of have important internal things, especially after seeing the Korean War. Mm -hmm. So let's just say that we'll get in, we'll 
we'll send like guns and stuff, but we'll but we won't directly declare war until uh, U.S. troops cross the pre um, the pre war border. Hmm. Okay, that's interesting. So it's it's, it's a, a swap of what happened in Korea. In Korea, you had China was sending their troops over. And Russia was kind of reluctant. Yeah, or I mean, Soviet, I'm sorry. The or I mean, I feel like it was more. It was in this, in this case, the Soviets are more openly supporting. Yeah, Vietnam, they're sending and, their and equipment. The Chinese are more reluctant to. Yeah, the Soviets are sending investments and equipment. Okay. And um, the U.S. is sending troops and uh, equipment. Okay. And um, so, and the sub the southern Vietnamese are um, kind of split. It, because remember, um, while more communists were in the north, the Viet Cong, the front of basically all of the parties that were all allied with Ho Chi Minh, mm -hmm. that that organization originally started in um, in in the south. Mm -hmm. So um, there was s evidently some communist support. Okay, and. Um, and there were some who um, viewed the U.S. as, you know, just being imperialist. Hmm. And they did not want to just transfer from French imperialism to American imperialism. Right. Like, okay. that doesn't seem a good trade to them. Yeah. So, um... And this, the Vietnam War, um, officially it's called the Second Indochina War, but hmm. Americans will know it as the Vietnam War. Okay. Um, this war... It goes on for ages. Wow. I don't... What, like 10 years? It goes... It goes on until 75. Wow, 20 years. And... Yeah, and for a while it's just a stalemate where the U.S. is bombing uh, the heck out of uh, mm. n northern Vietnam because they mm. think that, you know, okay, we can't cross our troops, but if we bomb them enough, then maybe they'll give up. A war of attrition, right? Yeah. We just bomb them, demoralize them until they give up, but, but it didn't work. Because it didn't work, and you would think that we, you would think the United States might learn from that experience because we've had um, sort of, there, there's some similarities there without going off on too much of a tangent. There's some similarities there in what has happened in this century, the first 20 years of this century with our eternal conflict over in the Middle East. Yeah. Anyway, back to Vietnam. Back to Vietnam. Um, but over the course of the 60s, um, advantage. More and more advantages fall into Vietnam hands. Mm. The biggest one being the rise of the anti-war movement. Mm -hmm. You know, pe people in the U.S. start resisting the war. Right. And right, they're asking, why are we on the other side of the world? Yeah. Sending people. Why are we spending so many resources, spending so, wasting so many lives on the other side of the world? What's the point? Yeah, it gets to the point where it becomes almost a bipartisan issue, and the only people still supporting the war are you know, top-level politicians in the federal government. Interesting. A lot of similarities to uh, what we have today, because if you look at our our ongoing conflict, our, our nearly two-decade-long conflict in the Middle East we've had since since uh, after the, the World Trade Center of 2001, um, it's very unpopular on both sides, yeah. both sides of the political spectrum, but yet it seems like there's always a politician willing to support it. Yeah, there's always somebody willing to profit from it. So yeah, but this uh, reduced war effort eventually, eventually, um, uh, two things happen. One, eventually, the U.S. decides to drop the bombing and um, just focus on um, ensuring that South Vietnam is secure, rather than focusing on trying to take over the North, which is what they had hoped to do earlier. Mm -hmm. And they're and then this leads to, in 69, the Tet Offensive, hmm. where, the, where the Northern Vietnamese, after doing guerrilla for a while, basically uh, surprised the U.S. with a major offensive, and it ends up quite successful, both in terms of morale and just pure, like, uh, land occupation. Hmm. And this uh, bolsters the anti-war effort in, the, in inside the United States, mm. and eventually convinces some politician politicians to support the removal of troops. Mm, okay, what year did they start talking about the removal of troops? Like 
the end of the 1960s. Oh, end of the 1960s. Okay, so this is going on for years before the conflict finally ends. Yeah. But eventually, uh, troops starting getting removed, um, and then in uh, the and then in the early seventies, the cap the capital of South Vietnam, the historical capital of um, Vietnam, um, Saigon, mm -hmm. is taken by the North Vietnamese Communist forces. Oh wow! Um, the 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 capital of the of the People's Republic of Vietnam is quickly moved from Hanoi, the previous capital, to the uh, newly taken city of Saigon. Wow. Then, then they rename it to Ho Chi Minh City. Okay. This is real. Hmm. And and with, by 1975, the conflict has wrapped up. The last pockets of South Vietnamese resistance have, for the most part, disappeared. Wow, okay. So the U.S. has spent 20 years there, and essentially, at the end of it, all they have to show for is they got pushed out. Yeah. By Ho Chi Minh's army. And Ho Chi Minh is leading the Vietnamese, the northern Vietnamese yeah, he's the, the entire time. Yeah. Okay. All 20 years of this. Yeah, and, for, and even those who don't like the communist government, a lot of them have just had their morale so worn down by this They're just constant tired warfare. Of, they're tired of two decades of war. But even after the war, the... The consequences and destruction from the war are devastating. Not only were not only were lots of lives lost, you know, in the combat, mm. but bombing campaigns and uh, have had destroyed much of the arable land mm. and uh, farm and landmines. Don't they? Don't they have problems yes. with landmines? They so still have really... landmines that occasionally a person accidentally steps wow. on. That's terrible. Yeah, you can't even you can't even walk around in peace there. You have to. Um, worry about landmines from decades earlier. Yep. Um, and um, because of all of this destruction, um, and not helped by, you know, they try to centrally plan everything mm -hmm. when, you know, they don't have the world's best planners. Right. Um, starvation starts to set in. I couldn't, uh -oh. I couldn't find numbers, but some, but many sources say that the numbers are comparable to Mao. Wow, how many people lived in Vietnam? I want to say like 70 million. Wow, and we may have in the tens of millions. Yeah. Because how many died under Mao? Like 30 million? 45. 40, 45 million. Or 75 by the end of his reign, 45 in the, you know, Great Famine. Okay, well I hope it's not 75 million dying when there's only 70 million in the country. Yeah. That'd be pretty bad. But So we don't know the exact number. We do know it was very significant. So yes. It's a, it's a combination of their infrastructure being completely just destroyed, plus the um, pattern we often see in communist-ruled central command economies, which is where there's just food shortages of mass starvation. Yeah, and and so we get that's a, that's a pretty bad combination when you put those two together, and so you have a very large percentage of the population dies of yeah. starvation. Soviet investment was somewhat helpful, but by the eighties, as I mentioned, this was starting to shore up. Yeah, the Soviets themselves were struggling. They were they were their own um, republic was yeah. unraveling. So by the 80s and the 90s, Vietnam started to transition to more of a market economy, mm -hmm. and um, the, and their food supply and their population was some was uh, more stabilized by accepting uh, food imports from capitalist nations. Mm -hmm. But um, but Vietnam uh, still suffers from landmines yeah, and wow. and. Uh, the difficulty in build, in rebuilding an economy after twenty years of warfare is evident. Mm. But um, it wasn't just in Vietnam. There was spillover in the neighboring countries of Laos and Cambodia. Wow! Um, Pretty amazing that this all started. They they're all based off of Marxist idealism. Is that correct? It's all. It's all rooted in that. Maybe they had their own Asian way of doing it, but ultimately it's all rooted Yeah, in all this. based on his theory. Like, there, there's an argument to be made that if it weren't Marx, it would have been, you know, maybe the syndicalists or something, but... Right, exactly, I understand that. But, but essentially, we can say this is all rooted in a 19th century philosopher who lived in Germany. 
yeah. and, it, and then it spread all the way through to the eastern parts of Asia. Yeah. Okay, so what happened? Where do you, where do you want to go, do next? Cambodia or Laos? Uh, Laos, we can just touch on, you know, there, there were some communist parties that had aligned themselves. Laos is a smaller country, isn't it? Yeah, it's okay. very, like, it's like a thin strip of land, basically. Okay. They did, did they have any Soviet or Chinese backing? Uh, just backing from the Vietnamese. V oh, wow. Vietnamese were back then. Because there was some spillover, considering, you know, they're right next to each other. Oh, okay. I see. And they're both, like, very thin strips of land. Okay. Or not very thin, but still thin. Yeah, but you said Vietnam had something like 70 million people, so they still have a significant population. Yeah. Laos is even smaller, but there was spillover from Ho Chi Minh. Yeah. Huh, interesting. So the Soviets were backing Ho Chi Minh, and Ho Chi Minh was backing the... Um, communist in Laos. Yeah. Now, um, however, what's really in interesting is in Cambodia, or Kampuchea, according to some. Okay. Yeah, this is because there was a... There were, of course, you know, the communists, you know, the internationalists, who were more aligned with, the, with Ho Chi Minh. However, there was... A, and there were, you know, the more conservative groups that, you know, opposed uh, any sort of communism. However... Um, in, within all the destruction, the memories of French op oppression, uh, there rose a certain combination, uh, called the Khmer Rouge. Mm. The, literally, the Red Khmer's. Uh, they're named after the Khmer Empire, which was yeah. an empire founded in that area that had once been very prominent in Southeast Asia. And okay. it's and it's responsible for construction of, of great monuments like the Angkor Wat. Okay, and red as in, like, the reds going back to the Bolsheviks. Yeah. Okay. Um, except these were, were these were Bolsheviks, of course, but also mm. national Bolsheviks. Mm. Uh, they Nazbols. have bowls. Yep. They, su they supported the, the removal of all foreign influence mm. and just a strong socialist state that was entirely you know, Kampuchea, as they mm. called it. They, okay. I don't know why they renamed it from Cambodia to Kampuchea, mm. but they were pretty insistent on that. Okay. And, I'm um... I'm guessing maybe they had some sort of uh, traditional relevance to their... Probably. Their nation. That, I mean, that would explain why they called themselves the Khmer. Right. Um, and they... And the Khmer Rouge um, used very violent tactics to take power, and they... Some people were sympathetic to their... Some people liked their rhetoric of driving out imperialists and also establishing socialism. Um, both of those rhetorics appealed to some people, but largely they used uh, violence to take over. Hmm. And they opposed both Ho Chi Minh and the United States, but with the U.S. more focused on Vietnam, um, the Khmer Rouge eventually were able to... During the 70s, uh, the Khmer Rouge eventually took power in uh, Cambodia and established the Republic of Kampuchea. Okay. And they were very violent. Mm. Like, a, they, were, they were probably the most violent towards religion uh, of any of the wow. states we discussed because... Um, what was the religion... The major the the majority religion was Theravada Buddhism. Mm. However, there were you know there was a significant minority of Muslims, mm. and there were actually quite a few uh, people who had converted to Catholicism uh, mm. during uh, the French rule. Okay. And to all of these people, uh, the Khmer Rouge had no sympathy. So they just killed the priest. Is it that kind of thing? Uh, not just the priest, but anyone oh, who faithful. Were Anyone who refused to renounce their religion. Wow. Uh, it, Muslims were killed. Um, Christians were tried as CIA agents. Hmm. Okay. Wow. So these people who were, um, had, had, um, what do you call it? Uh, it was the French. It was French Catholicism. They, they French had Catholicism, it. Indonesian Islam, and Theravada but I'm, Buddhism. But I'm saying that's interesting. They called them CIA agents. Yeah. They were, they were, it was, they had nothing to do with the United States government. They were, um, they had, um, become faithful to the French Catholicism. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, um, CIA agents. Theravada, there were some sects of Theravada that they were a bit kinder to, but even then, they eventually got around to, uh, 
taking out the monks and the mm -hmm. priests. Wow. And, and... Well, what do they do? They, they, did they send them off or they just killed them? Just, they just shot them. They just shot them. Wow. Often cool. in, uh, op yeah, often in firing squads. Wow. Um, officially, the, 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 according to the party, the number is only 37,000. Mm -hmm. We don't have any, they're, they're resistant, they have, um, done everything in their power to prevent, uh, historians from seeing what, to finding evidence for Counting the actual, and things like that. for the actual number, yeah. but... It's probably something ridiculous. Yeah, we think it could... You're saying it could potentially be much higher than that. Yeah. Wow. But that's... Yeah, what's the... Do we know the size of Cambodia? Like, the, the total population? Um, not off the top of my head. Okay, what I know is that it's a small country. Okay. And, um... But based on, based on what you've read, based on their size, the number may have been far higher. Then, far greater than 37,000. Yeah. Okay. And, um... Did they persecute anybody else, or was it just religious people? Also, political enemies... Oh, political um, enemies. Anybody who... Any, basically, anyone if you have who, an opinion that's, that's opposed to the Khmer Rouge in yeah, any way... Yeah, in fact, it, even could. if you had, um, formerly been part of a capitalist political party, even maybe no longer were part of that party, they'd say, Ah, oh, you only changed because we took power. You're still a capitalist at heart. Bang. Wow. It's brutal. Yeah. Yeah, especially under the... You may have heard of Pol Pot. He was the guy in charge of all of this. Mm -hmm. After his death, they became, you know, less violent. But, you know... I, I believe the, the party is still technically in power. Well, so. maybe, were they less violent because they already killed all of their enemies? I, there, that, there's, no, there's nobody left to kill. That, that and, you know, part of it was fueled by, you know, Pol Pot being... Being a little bit, a little bit less extreme, or being, you know, Pol Pot was the guy, you know, who was encouraging all of this. Oh, okay. Are you saying after Pol Pot, it became less violent? Yeah. After Pol Pot, I understand. Yeah. Okay. So was anybody? So the U.S. did not get involved in the Cambodian communist takeover. Yeah, and I mean, it's important to note that they took over around the time Vietnam was wrapping up, so... Oh, they took over in the so anti in, So anti-interventionist in sentiments were at their peak in the United States. Okay, so yeah, so the U.S. was anti-interventionist, um, had just been pushed out of Vietnam by Ho Chi Minh, essentially, Yeah. and then the Khmer Rouge says, oh, now's the time to seize power here, yep. and the U.S. says, no, we're not getting involved in this again. Yeah. Like we're not going back to Asia and fighting this again. Yeah. Okay, and then, you know, Khmer Rouge just has, uh, there's nobody stopping them. They basically just say, eh, you're Buddhist, we'll kill you. Eh, you're Christian, we'll kill you. Eh, you're Muslim, we'll kill you. Oh, you may have one point expressed some kind of political ideology that we don't like. You're dead. See ya. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yep. And, um, that's pretty much all of the, um... Movements that I want to talk about. Okay, okay, and how long is the is the Khmer Rouge still in power in Cambodia? Um, I believe they may have gone out in like the eighties or the nineties. But oh, okay, so they. I, I I I need to double check that. Okay. I'm sure we can put a note here. Yeah, we'll put a note. We'll find out for sure how long they they retain power. Okay, but um, you know, and but that's about it. You know, there had. There, in other countries, there were, you know, people attempting to organize political parties, but um, for the most part, in, in Japan, any efforts were stopped by the U.S. and outside, and even outside of Japan, you know, various people had their own, various people, you know, um, uh, they, all, various movements, you know, failed, so. Okay. All right, well, that was a good discussion of the, or the, the communism communist revolutions and communists uh, taking power in Eastern Asia. And then we have one more episode left in our series on communist revolutions of the 20th century, and we will be discussing the downfall of the Soviet Union. Yeah. So, yep. Do you have any final comments you wanted to make? Um, you ever heard the song Holiday in Cambodia? I have not heard that okay. song. I'm going to put it in the, the as we what I um, Did, you, did you hear the song? I, you hear the song I added to the end of our last episode? 
Or I, I don't think I. Oh, okay. It's a it's an old punk rock song where he's singing about the Berlin Wall. Uh, anyway, there's there's one about uh, called Holiday in Cambodia, and uh, he's singing about Pol Pot and things like that. I'll put that in. Here, but, yeah. So uh, um, there was this one clever comment I had. Um, from a guy who was mooching off his uh, friend mm. and who wrote a book called The Communist Manifesto oh. to um, a guy called Pol Pot, these ideas, there's something else. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Something else is, is one way to describe it. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in to the History Talks, and we'll see you in our next episode on the fall of the Soviet Union. All right. Good job, man. It's a holiday in Cambodia.